Good afternoon, and welcome to IHA's webinar Wednesday with What's Cooking? Our guest speaker is Penny Rosna. She's the Managing Director of the Cookware Manufacturers Association. The CMA is a not-for-profit trade association owned by its membership, manufacturers of cookware, bakeware, and kitchenware with substantial operations and headquarters in the United States. The CMA helps develop engineering standards for the industry, disseminates information to consumers, retailers, and manufacturers, and offers forums for members to learn about the latest advances in manufacturing, retailer, retailing, distribution, and materials. Today, Penny will walk us through a look at the leading trends in cookware, discuss what is new in the category, and look at what influences the category performance? It gives me it gives me great pleasure to introduce Penny. Thank you, Jenny. Oh, let's get started then. I want to say welcome to everyone joining the webinar. It's a pleasure to be here. As Jenny mentioned, we will kind of cover four major areas: the statistics, some factors that are driving demand. Look at the cookware and bakeware consumer and spend a little time looking into the future, give some predictions on where we think think things are going. And I will uh, hold on here, Jenny. I'm trying to get control. There we go. As Jenny mentioned, I come from into the CMA role as managing director. I just joined in January of 2016. Many of the participants may remember Hugh Rushing. He was leader of the CMA for 24 years, and he's doing terrific. I talked to him recently. He's enjoying retirement and uh, sends his best regards to everybody in the industry. Jimmy talked a little bit about our mission and who we serve, but this is our actual mission statement. Um, cookware manufacturers, we promote the optimal and appropriate design, manufacture, sale, use, and service of cookware and bakeware through quality standards, development, information sharing, education, impartial communication to members of the association, their trade partners, and consumers. When I joined CMA, we visited with a few of the CMA members, and I ask a common question, you know, why are you in CMA and why do you remain? And there are three main main statistics or main reasons that members are embedded and value their membership. One is our statistical reporting. We'll talk through some of the high level information on that. Of course, members get a deeper dive and more information. The second big reason is the cookware bakeware engineering standards. So we maintain those standards. And you know, just a little message on the standards. The US approach to standards is to um, is driven by the private industry versus government um, establishing the standards. You know, the government doesn't have the resources, the breadth, or the depth of experience or the agility to stay um, current with the kind of standards. So that's the second big reason CMA is, is around and, and, and a valuable membership. And then, of course, the third one is our networking. Just it's the great value in knowing your competitors. These are intelligent and savvy uh, professionals. They are facing similar challenges, and we share real world experiences and raise the bar for the industry. Some of the brands you may know that are part of the Cookware Association. And a reminder to everyone that we will be sending out this presentation in a PDF format um, after the presentation. So a little bit of information about our market intelligence. Um, anybody that's been, been in the forecasting or statistical role, you know that it's a moving target. You have many variables that are coming in. Uh, statistics come from a variety of sources. And I'm sure you as participants are hearing different types of information from different sources. And what we encourage everyone to do is to take the information we are getting here today along with other resources. You need to compare that and adapt it to your industry. And then you'll be able to follow and see trends. We're happy to share the information that we have. In many cases, it matches other information that I've heard, and sometimes it doesn't. And with that, we'll start with some of the statistics. In aluminum cookware, 
In 2016 versus 15, we saw a 3.6% increase. Year to date in aluminum, it's at a minus 9%. We haven't hit the um, Christmas uh, plunge yet, but um, that's what we're seeing so far this year. In stainless steel cookware, it was flat for 2016, and our numbers are reporting in down so far for 2017. Kind of a recap in the aluminum category, year to date it's down 9%. The colored aluminum is down 12. That's thicker gauge colored, colored aluminum. And then uh, less than eight gauge is down 3.5%. Stainless steel year to date is showing us down 15%. Multiply is down 20. Fabricated is flat and single wall is down 14. For 2016, our cast iron, porcelain on steel, and copper, we combined all of that together, is up from 2015 at 5.75%. Year to date, cast iron and porcelain on steel and copper is up 12%. Cast iron especially is very popular and continues to um, grow. In the bakeware category, we're showing it flat for 2016 versus 15, and year to date up 6%, 6 percent, 6.3 percent for year to date in 2017. The kitchenware category is flat, both uh, in our records from 2016 and year to date for 2017. And I want to remind listeners that kitchenware for this report does not include gadgets. We're talking about items used in prep, in food prep, such as mixing bowls, food mills, graters, grinders, that sort of thing, um, not gadgets. Tea kettles. Tea kettles are up for 2016 and just a slightly up so year to date in 2000. 17, and that's an interesting category that, that there's, I know there's a cyclical demand that goes on with uh, tea kettles, and I'm just seeing a lot of, um, a lot of unusual figures coming in with tea kettles. So um, showing it up and strong for 2016 for sure, and uh, still going strong, slightly up at 2.8 in 2017. We always like to throw in some additional information about um, our reports that we're getting in from the um, tracking that we do for the import of cookware and bakeware. Uh, cookware shipments were up in 2016 over 2015 by 3.3%. China remains a major producer of cookware and bakeware and kitchenware. Now in the first six months of 16, um, imports are up by 11.5% in dollars and 11% in units. And the average price is showing down by about 9%. Uh, we do recognize that Chinese producers continue to face you know, wage pressures and other challenges. Um, other factors that we could keep in mind include US trade agreements. You've heard this on the news. There's a lot going on with uh, trade agreements around the world. Um, there's focus on infrastructure, on healthcare and tax reform. And all of these issues um, may influence our reshoring of cookware and bakeware. It's, to be seen, something to watch. We like to spend a little bit of time walking through consumer preferences to give you an idea what we're seeing in within the categories, how they're split. So if we look at aluminum cookware in 2017, anodized cookware was 36% of the dollars. Colored aluminum was at 56 polished exterior at 7%. Nonstick is about 85% of the dollars and 90% of the units. That's in the aluminum category. Again, reminder, we'll be able to send this information out to you so you don't have to scribble down a lot of numbers. The stainless steel cookware in 2017, you have multiply at 61%, fabricated bottom 30%, 36% and single wall at 3%. Let 
let's talk a little bit about bakeware. What we have is a unit shipment report, and we do it twice a year out to uh, collect data. And the June of 2016 report didn't vary a lot from 2016. So this is 2017. Cake pans and similar are at 30%. Cookie sheets at 22%. Muffin pans at 8 Loaf pans at 5 Meat roasters at 4%. Your pie pans and miscellaneous take up the last two categories at 2 and 29%. For year, for the you know the years that we have been presenting this webinar, uh, we have um, participated by pro <laughs> in our participation. We have provided you with in information that's noteworthy about what's driving demand. I get my tongue untied here for a moment, and the information is updated. It's worth repeating. There are factors that drive the demand in cookware and bakeware that we have found through he historical experience. We start with the first one, which is new household formations. Think of marriages, divorces, uh, graduations. The US has 118 million households. There are about 1.1 million formed annually. That hasn't changed much from last year. The spike from 2015 in new households has slowed a little bit, but it is still growing at 9%. And you probably um, recognize that if you're out in the market for either selling your home, how quickly it's sold, or uh, trying to find something, the inventory is very tight. The Census Bureau projects that household formation is going to average 1.4 to 1.5 million through 2020. And then you've got the population shift. Uh, that's an interesting one, and they talked about it, and we'll talk about it a little bit later in this um, slide at, at the CHESS event, the International Housewares event that was held in October. Um, languages that we, uh, foundational phrases, I guess you call them, that we heard there was the senior tsunami. You know, the growth segment of the millennials and seniors is shifting into the kind of the spend category. There's buying power of the boomers. They've got disposable income. They're ready to spend. They are working longer, as in longer in their in their age category, and or they're mapping out active retirements. They're not just um, settling into to sit at home. The millennials are getting starting to be free of their college debt. They're loosening up their purse strings a bit. And then the third point about that is interesting is that the younger consumers are influencing the older consumers. Let me give you an example. You have a bridal shower. Grandma goes to the bridal registry and picks out the, the new you know, piece of cookware for the bride. And as she's investigating and learning about what's this new innovation or a new feature of, of um, the standard piece that she's had, and she walks away with, I want one too. So highlighting product features, something the consumer might not have been aware of before. And the other part of that younger and senior influence is look for shareable experiences. And we're going to talk a little bit about, more about this again um, in this presentation. So new household formations, one factor that drive demand. New home construction. Here's some data for you on new home construction. Uh, 781,000 units in 2016. In the second quarter of 2017, we're at 9.17% higher. And there's a big development going in in my community just down the street, 100 and some new homes. The median price of new single family homes has risen. It's now at 300,200, 300, uh, up just slightly. It was a high uh, 290s, I think, last year. A third factor that drives demand in our industry is remodeling. And there's something called the Residential Remodeling Index. And that's on an increase again this year of 4.6%. And they're forecasting that it's going to average 3.4% through 2020. Interesting information that impacts our industry, factors that drive demand. Now, economic trends is another topic that we always talk about in our webinar here with you at IHA. And 
this uh, trends, what we're, we're tracking is, you know, consumer spending, right? Obviously, where they're, you know, what, what's our confidence level? And as you are all probably very well aware, unemployment is at 4.9%. I mean, look at this graph where it was in 2010 and how it has dramatically dropped. So when incomes are up, unemployment is low, interest rates are low, and gasoline is cheap, it's pretty clear there's going to be strong consumer confidence. Now, strong consumer confidence and spending haven't been exactly the same for us, but um, okay, now I've lost my, hold on folks, there we go. Uh, let's see here, apologies for that. So we did the unemployment, now you're seeing that the um, employment rate, so we did unemployment was going down, and the non-farm payrolls, which is your employment, is going up. So okay, they they have more money to spend, but the gist or the observations we have is that there's some cautious spending. They aren't going crazy with their spending. If I can get going in the right direction here for you. There we go. So the fifth factor that drives demand is entertaining. When people are in the mood for spending and they're bringing people into their homes and entertaining obviously hits our industry. Get the right door here. So the economic indicator, interesting enough, what we use is the beer and wine and liquor stores in California. And, and Hugh has been following this for a long time. When that is up, people are more likely to be obviously entertaining at home. What else drives the cookware and bakeware purchases? Here are some items. We pulled this um, from polling that was done by the Good Housekeeping. It's a little bit older, but the, the information is still true. Their cookware is worn out. Uh, they have specific recipe needs. Cookware doesn't look good. They want to improve the look of their kitchen. And one of the top Topics that came up at the chess event again this year, 2017, was the social media a factor, I'm going to call it. It's just another um, maybe category of its own. But the role that it's playing in all consumer spending, you know, their, their ability to get video content, um, see consumers' reviews, pick up new creative ideas, get new recipes, identify baking uh, tips and tricks, you know. Which leads us to that topic of chess. Oh, doggone it, I'm hitting the wrong key all the time. All right. The chess event, uh, just to remind you what that's about, that's the Chief Housewares Executive Super Session. And it's in Chicago in October. And in 2018, it'll be October 2nd and 3rd. It was the first event that I'd been to, but uh, I was very impressed with the level of speakers and the information. So we talk about, um, you know, where you get your sources of information, the statistics that we're sharing here with you, the PDF you'll be able to reference later on. But where do you go for additional sources of information? I'm sure you have your favorites. If chess is not on the list, I recommend that you put it out there as a possible option for next year. Um, I'll share with you a two, I mean, I couldn't take a two days worth of information and download to you, but I'll share with you two factors or two points of interest that I thought were extremely valuable and might pique your interest to do your own investigation. So one of the items they talked about under consumer trends is to look at how people are spending their money, not just what they are buying. And this was a, a quote from Marshall Cohen. Uh, he did the, was from the NPD group at Chess. And he talked about, you know, their consumers are looking at experiments their discovery options, sharing, creating mem memories, spending time together. That's what's important to them when they're spending their, um, you know, the valuable dollars and they're careful about where they're spending. And um, what you need to, from a retail side, let's think about this. It, it would be, you know, teach me how, uh, give me an experience with my friends, show me how entertaining, show me a new skill, um, give me something I can share with social media. Uh, they're interested in a healthier living and a healthier life. So you want to think of your comp competition maybe from a different angle. Um, maybe not so much about who the other competitors are as a manufacturer or the retailers, 
but who you're competing against from a spending point of view. And um, lots more you can dive into on that one, but look at how people are spending their money, not just what they are buying, what are their choices, and then how can you leverage that within your industry. The other hot topic I was fascinated with, and I hadn't heard it with this um, title put on it, omnipresence, being present everywhere. Yeah, if you look up the um, definition of it, uh, you know, seamless customer experience, uh, the strategy is to have customer value, uh, the, the strategy is that the customer values the ability to be in constant content contact with a company through multiple avenues at the same time. I stumbled on that, so let me repeat it. The customer values, the ability to be in constant contact with a company through multiple avenues at the same time. This can be the physical location, you know, what you have on the web page, the social media, the web chats. Um, a simplistic view, I guess, for the cookware would be, you know, a consumer finds a recipe on Instagram. They click to the recipe. It requires a new piece of cookware. They search their purchase op options. Um, they see what's online. They see what stores carry it. Do they have it in stock? Uh, they go into the store and they have an app that matches the experience that they had at home. You know, it's similar app. The experience is the same. It's a they're able to ask questions in the store, either online through their app or to a live person. So they're talking about the omnipresence and the omni-channel. Two topics that were um, very interesting at the chess event. Let's talk a little bit about the consumer. Uh, this segment, we always uh, give you some information about what's happening with the consumers. I mean, as far as it's it's pretty evergreen, the strategies that you use for the cookware and bakeware sec, uh, segment, but always like to review them with um, you on this webinar. So there are two segments. One wants cooking to be easy, and the other one is building skills and exploring new cooking dishes. Um, it, if you're focusing on the savings of the benefit for you, Time-saving benefits, you want to see, they want convenience. Um, think of Blue Apron, HelloFresh, Plated. Uh, if they're skill building, although even with these uh, Blue Apron, HelloFresh, and Plated, remember, they still have to cook it. So, you know, they have it, it's time savings, but they still, at their, their house, they still have to get the, the cookware out and the bakeware out. And then, of course, on the skill building side, you know, creating memory makers, giving them experiences, again, the omni-channel ex, uh, experience we talked about before. How often is cookware bought? Remember that 90% uh, of our uh, consumers will replace their cookware in a 10-year period. So it translates into a, a replacement buys in your market. Trends in cookware, uh, you got the non-stick improvements. Consumers want durability um, and we're, the industry is providing it. You've got space considerations. The purchase of individual pieces is still trending over the purchase of cookware sets. And there's still a color revolution. Things are brighter. There's a lot of options in, uh, especially in non-stick colors. And uh, your cast iron still is on its resurgence. It's just going strong. Uh, channel strength trends. You have um, bland, brand blurring. Amazon, the new rule, there are no rules. They talked about this at the chess event again. Um, if you haven't seen it, Whole Foods is becoming Amazon's brick and mortar pricing lab. Lots going on in that world. You want to stay current and, and keep up on what's happening with the uh, world of Amazon because it changes by the day. Um, omnipresence, we talked about that, that customer's path to purchase. Think about the triggers to put in your product to keep it top of mind and to stay connected with your consumer. And then your supermarkets, yep, they're still growing more sophisticated and there are cross merchandising opportunities. We talk about consumer preferences. You know, they want to feel the product. Uh, they had a panel at Chess uh, with kind of an 
impromptu um, panel of consumers. And it, it was interesting the number of women that did still want to feel the product. They're not, you know, in cookware, it's not as easy to just look at something online and purchase it. They said they like to be able to see and feel um, and how this translates to your retail strategy is, uh, you know, make sure you got some product out of the box. You know, the height of where it is uh, visually to be seen and handled. And don't forget to leverage your social media before, during, and after the sale. Uh, consumers want information, having well-trained staff. And again, think about the omnipresence. And we always like to remind you that we have resources on cookware.org for buyer learning tools. Um, this is a screenshot from our webpage, but I will have my contact information at the end of this uh, presentation. So feel free if you have trouble getting to, to this link. But it um, is a great resource for retailers, especially if you've got some new staff coming on and, and you need to have them up and trained. These units are easy to read. Um, excellent resource we want to remind you is a benefit of logging into cookware.org. Again, consumer preference, preference, they are looking for an experience. And the retailing strategy connected with this is that you can help build that confidence, um, you know, have that omnipresence, um, train people. Retailers have the opportunity to really address all three of those preferences um, from the consumers. What matters to consumers? 40% is based on the, what material they're buying, price factors in, the brand not so much, and um, more and more brand preferences kind of not being a driving factor, and appearance is both at 12%. What are the turnoffs? Uh, the food sticks, loose handles, uh, handles that get hot, stuff that's hard to clean, and poor cooking performance. I hear a lot about durability, consumers' preference for durability. We talk about material and coatings. Um, Nonstick coatings are better than ever. You've got diamond coatings, textured surfaces. surfaces. Um, they're durable, easy to clean. They've got new release benefits. Consumers want nonstick that holds the nonstick property over time. Um, as you all probably well know by now, the traditional nonsticks are no longer made with PFOA, but I still continue to get calls once in a while with concerns on that. So not all of the consumers are up to date on that information. And then the ceramic nonstick is you know, still kind of a mixed bag. It's our findings that it's not as popular as when it first launched, um, but that's still a, um, you know, ceramic is still an option out there for consumers. Again, the quality of manufacturing in materials and coatings has, in, you know, to, continues to increase. There's a value proposition there. Um, there's enhanced durability. Uh, manufacturers are focusing on performance. There's a lot of great color changes. They got bolder palettes. There's some mats out there, um, stain resistance, and manufacturers are continually looking at improvements. So let's talk a little bit about the future. Um, they have more sophisticated alternatives in nonstick. Um, the consumers are looking for that strong value proposition, both in nonstick. And if you talk about bakeware, they're looking at, uh, they want durability. Um, individualized serving continues to be a trend. So they like to entertain and have little individual serving sizes for their guests. Textured pieces are popular. And uh, the commercial grade continues to trend up in bakeware. The omnipresence, we've talked a little bit about that. They want experiential. They want contact through the company through multiple avenues at the same time. We have uh, millennials and seniors with buying power. That's a segment of growth. And you want to be able to create shareable experiences. They're looking for products that save time and money, and again, that unexpected experience. Something we haven't talked about yet was the weather. We've had hurricanes, floods, and fires. The 
information that I'm getting is that it could have an overall negative impact on the remainder of 2017, especially in the cookware, bakeware. People aren't maybe quite replacing that yet as they're rebuilding their homes. But there could be the reverse of that in 2018 as we start in that replacement wave. So more to be seen on that. Uh, shameless plug here for the Cookware Manufacturers Association. We are on the web at cookware.org. There are three distinct sections on cookware.org. One is for members. We have a consumer uh, section of our site and for retailers. On the retailer's side, um, don't forget about that guide to cookware and bakeware, another great resource if you're training new staff. If you're on the manufacturing or distribution side, um, a great opportunity to clear up and catch up on what's the important information that you need to know about cookware. And, you know, let's get to know each other. I will be at the Ambiente in February and at the IHA show in Chicago with the International Housewares Association. Uh, love to get to know you. If you have questions, reach out to me. And at this portion of the presentation, we take a break and a breath to see if there are any questions. Jimmy, have you heard? Okay, oh, Penny, we do have a few questions. Um, one is, where can I get more information about the Omnipresence Omni Channel? Uh, a great place to start is to just Google it. You'll find it's it'll pop up there with lots of information, lots of different uh, resources. Uh, another example is if once you're aware of the omnipresence and omni-channel kind of phenomenon, you'll see it even though it's not called that in a number of places. You know, one of the perfect example is uh, Homeworld. I believe it was August of 2017, Homeworld Magazine. They had an article with Bed bath and beyond about integrating the digital and showroom floor and of course um, we'll share this presentation today and I'll try to make sure I put in some uh, links that you can uh, find more information from that as well okay great um, you mentioned uh, buyer training tools where is that link again great uh, the buying tools a person if they are having trouble finding it certainly reach out to me at uh, you know prose my cookware.org but if you go to the cookware.org site there is a link for retailer and when you're in that retailer link section there is a um, menu bar on the right hand side of the page and as you scroll down that page you will see a link that says buyer learning tools Okay, super. Uh, where can I get more information about membership with Cookware uh, Manufacturers Association? Again, I've got my email note there, but uh, also my, my phone number is 616-987-3520. And the Cookware Association are manufacturers and distributors that have a company presence in the US like a sales office warehousing logistics or both um, they're they're in uh, control of the production of their wares that's no toll manufacturing um, and there are a limited number of supplier members as well and those supplier members are nominated by CMA members themselves so they make recommendations for supplier members and if you you know in doubt or have questions um, reach out to me let's have a conversation um, we love to share the benefits of uh, the association membership. Any other questions? Um, how much does the consumer spend on an aluminum cookware set? That's a difficult question to answer. That You know, it, it depends. I don't have, um, but I will look up and see what the what our average was on imports. I'll see if I can pull that number up. But I don't have an average number right off the top of my head, Jenny. I'll make a note okay. of that. Um, another question, do you publish a tea kettle suppliers list? I do not publish. I get a call quite frequently, probably a couple of times a, a week, 
um, someone asking for something specific on a member. So, you know, we represent all of our member base, so we don't um, point to any one manufacturer or provide just a tea kettle manufacturer list. Okay. Do you feel more eco-focused brands, green pan, will will see growth in the market, or do consumers feel traditional brands and products have already chemical free? My exposure and my conversations and my personal opinion on that is that consumers, I still get a couple of calls on the PFOA, but I think consumers are beyond that, that they understand that the um, traditional nonstick is safe. Um, Every once in a while, I have different resources that'll say that the, the the ceramic nonsticks are popular, but I'm not seeing the same numbers. So um, I'm not sure where their resources are coming from or their data information is. So traditional, I think, is um, stronger than the ceramic. Okay. Well, that's all the questions we have. Um, and I would like to thank, oh, wait, we have one more. I'm sorry, Penny. Do you see that made in the USA still carries the same clout? You know, that's a difficult answer, question for me to answer. I don't, I don't have anything that, um, you know, statistical wise that I can tell you that I can point to. So it would, it would be just opinion. And the, uh, my opinion is that there's a lot of conversation about it because what's going on politically so it's top of mind for people. Um, and with the changes in the um, you know, trade agreements and all those other influences, made in USA you know, could be, you could see people reshoring. Um, but I don't have statistical information that says it one way or the other. All right, great. Well, that is it uh, for all the questions. On behalf of IHA, I would like to thank Penny and CMA for all their great material and once again having a great annual webinar on cookware and for those of you who are interested in receiving or watching the webinar again feel free to go to www.housewares.org and once again Penny on behalf of IHA thank you and thank you all for attending um, IHA's webinar Wednesday have a good day